Okay, so uh, we're joined on this Google Hangout now by uh, Jan Schaffer from the JLab in Washington in the United States. And JLab, Jan, I guess, is a, a think tank, really, for um, US media, and particularly you've done a lot of work around community media in the States and, indeed, globally to an extent as well. So um, I, I thought it would be really helpful for you just to talk us through a little bit about some of the, the trends and the developments you're seeing around community media in, in America. Well, JLab has actually helped start up a lot of community media with micro grants, um, both um, hyper local news media and women entrepreneur initiatives. Um, and I think what we see is a lot of activity going on right now in the um, community news space where people are um, starting to fill the gaps in news coverage that newspapers no longer are, are filling. So they're doing community news sites, they're doing regional news sites, Sometimes they're doing investigative news sites that are a little more ambitious and are doing statewide news coverage. And they're doing niche news sites. So arts and culture is a media desert right now. So they're filling in with arts and culture coverage or education coverage or health coverage or things like that. And, and by and large, how are these being paid for and how, how well staffed are they? Do they range from simply one person up to a team or what, what kind of things are you seeing? In the hyperlocal space, the staffs are very skeletal. These tend to be mom and pop shops, if you will, um, one or two or three people, um, a you know, a couple of freelancers, some student interns, um, some community com contributions. Uh, I I think in the investigative news space, they scale up a little larger, and you might see staffs of anywhere from five to thirty if you're the Texas Tribune or more if you're the Center for Investigative Reporting. Um, Center for Investigative Reporting now has a ten million dollar annual budget um, so that's pretty significant. Texas Tribune is operating more about in the four million dollar area. Um, how are they making a living? Well I think they're all developing micro streams of income. I think uh, some of its corporate sponsorships if you're a nonprofit corporate sponsorships, um, underwriting donors, members, and then events have come to the fore as a big way to generate, to both generate revenue and also to be a distribution platform uh, in, in a sense that events are journalism. I think if you're a for-profit, and many of the hyper-local sites are for-profit, um, you're, you're looking to supplement that with advertising or some consulting and training for merchants in your area. Okay, and what are some of the more sort of successful examples that, that, that you've seen? Any that stand out for you as being particularly interesting or, or particularly successful? Well, in the small space, in the hyper-local space, I think one of the trends that we see right now are um, news entrepreneurs starting to expand their operations into new locations. Uh, one of the most recent is uh, Scott Broadback, who founded Arlington Now, ARLnow.com, and he then um, expanded into Bethesda, which is a, another big metro area outside of Washington, D.C. And uh, just earlier this year, he added a site in Reston, Virginia. Um, so these are all kind of former patch area mm -hmm. sites that he's, he's now seeing an opportunity to expand in. And he sells ads. He makes a, enough of a, a living selling ads that he can do this and employ you know, a growing number of staffers. We've, that same model has played out in North Carolina where davidsonnews.net has expanded into corneliusnews.net. So we're seeing a, a little of the, uh, the satellite operations um, expanding. In so, the, sorry, I was going to say, so building out in this way into a kind of network of, of community sites allows them to kind of sell advertising across all the sites and opens up other commercial opportunities for them perhaps. Yes, well it, it does open up, um, it, it, you know, you've got a bigger audience for your merchants and if in the United States, if you want to appeal to a, a regional hospital or a grocery store chain to be a sponsor, it would help you m much more to have a bigger audience that they can take notice of and, and want to uh, feel that it's a good distribution platform for them. Now, if you're a nonprofit site, and, and most of the investigative news sites are nonprofit, um, I think for them it's it's a little different scenario. They're still looking for grants, although unfortunately, what's happening in the United States right now is that a lot of the funders have been in this field for three to five years now. We're starting to see some funder fatigue, so they have to, you know. Grants that are not being renewed have to be replaced by other streams of income, 
and some of those streams of income are um, working with um, uh, event coordinators to do like the big Texas Tribune Festival, um, which is a three-day information event that the Texas Tribune um, gets a lot of money from. Um, and so they're, they're supplementing with things like that. Another model that has emerged just in uh, 2013 are partnerships that some of the independent news sites are developing with public radio stations and public television stations. So in Colorado, for example, iNews has just fully merged with Rocky Mountain PBS, the public broadcasting network, and they are the newsroom for Rocky Mountain PBS. They have access to Rocky Mountain's, you know, 60,000 members. Um, they're employees of Rocky Mountain PBS now, um, and they're doing joint joint fundraising together. Um, and, and this a, is in an area where the local newspaper closed re quite recently. Is that right? One of the local newspapers in Denver closed. There's still the Denver Post, but the Rocky Mountain News closed, and. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, there were a lot of available journalists to help um, this enterprise. Um, I, I think in, in St. Louis you have a slightly different model where the St. Louis Beacon um, recently merged with St. Louis Public Radio. Now, St. Louis Public Radio already had a newsroom, but now the newsroom is more than double, and they have a lot more journalism firepower um, they'll co-occupy the same newsroom, they, they read down their hierarchy, the editor of the St. Louis Beacon is going to be the editor for the St. Louis Public Radio newsroom, and they really are reimagining um, a, a much more forceful and catalytic, if you will, coverage for the community. But this starts to take them away from being a kind of grassroots community site into being something much more akin to mainstream media, doesn't it? Well, it's it's sort of mainstream media, but when you um, when you're partnering with public media in the United States, they have a, a much more of a community mission mm -hmm. that that can uh, feel more comfortable um, activating the community around issues. Like in St. Louis, they might do a big campaign about obesity. All right. And, and part of that would be news stories, and part of it would be an educational campaign. It's a stuff that standard legacy newsrooms might not be quite as comfortable with. So it takes journalism, and when I said a more catalytic direction, it takes journalism into a different kind of an engagement model. Now, obviously the U.S. is some way ahead of certainly the U.K. and I suspect most of Europe in the development of community media. Do you think this is a kind of growth and development uh, line that you know, other parts of the world are likely to follow? We're going to see more partnerships and more integration with, um, with mainstream media in, that, in the way you've described? Or, or do you think it's peculiar to the U.S.? Well, I, think that the, I still think that newspapers are not as comfortable with the collaboration as the public radio stations have been. And, and we have funded a, a cup nine, in fact, funded nine pilot projects that dealt with partnering with, with newspapers. Um, and it's once the funding goes away, the kind of partnership goes away. Um, so even though they loved it and they got a lot out of it, they're not focusing resources on it. Um, public media is in a different place in that they're now in the United States having to very much think about um, what's going to happen if you can get all of public radio programming direct from NPR, you know, and you don't have to go to the local uh, outlets to get it, or what's going to happen if you can get all your music on Pandora, you know, and you don't have to listen to it on public radio. They need to figure out a different model for them, so they're very incentivized to look at partnerships in ways that um, help um, amplify journalism for the community, uh, help uh, donors love this, funders love this kind of collaboration, so it builds new relationships and new opportunities to get funding from their donors. So they have a little bit more incentive to do it than, than maybe the newspapers do. Okay, and what are some of the hallmarks of successful partnerships and successful collaborations? Because we all know that, that it's quite easy for these things to fall apart, but what, what are some of the, the common factors amongst the more successful ones that you've seen as community media starts to, to move forward in that way? Well, I think there has to be a win-win for both sides. Both sides feel they're getting something out of it. 
Um, so maybe an independent news startup is getting an, a, a megaphone for its journalism. They're certainly getting validation. They're getting access to eyeballs and, and potential donors that they couldn't. It would take them years to build that kind of network um, up. I think um, for uh, the mainstream news outlets, um, they're getting what is proven to be bona fide journalistic content. Uh, a lot of these news sites have shown that they are uh, they have journalistic values and ethics and and um, conventions that that produce news that they feel comfortable using. It's not a, a blogger in their pajamas in the basement writing uh, a screed about this or that. So um, they've kind of proven their track record. Um, so there can be a you know a, a win win. Nobody can cover it all anymore, and it doesn't make sense to do a lot of me too news where people are just running after the same stories. So if you want to have a value-added proposition, a news report that is giving people stuff they can't get elsewhere, partnerships are one way to go. So it's about understanding and respecting what each party can, can provide and, and support the other with. Right. And you're building silos. Now, down the road, silos can actually turn into other niche products. I mean, we're starting to see, you know, where um, somebody like Politico would put out a a special newsletter for political junkies or put out a, a, a print newspaper in New York with a new uh, capital that they just bought. So, you know, you want a broad array of news, but within that array, if you have silos, you, you can either do events around it or other niche products around it that can be other revenue streams. So obviously here in the UK we're at I think an earlier stage where we're, we're having more and more small very local community focused sites starting to grow but they're in the early early stages many of them. Right. What, what kind of advice would you give from your experience in the states where you've seen kind of smaller sites really start to scale up and, re and really start to, to succeed and embed themselves? What are some of the some of the advice you might offer from across the Atlantic? Well, I mean, I don't. I think you can assume that if you build it, they will come. You have to figure out how to let people know you're there and let them know you're there not just by going to your website, but using all the distribution channels available to you, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Facebook, whether it's a daily email feed, whether it's getting a spot on the local radio station to a talk, you know, a Q&A or a talk show, or it may be sharing your content with other media in the area, which is a big gulp for a lot of people, but again, it's a way of um, branding yourself and what you do and letting people notice. And then, um, you know, developing donors or funders is a high-touch enterprise, and I think um, you've got to be able not just to tell the story of your community, you've got to be able to tell the story of your own efforts. So you've got to be able to collect metrics and stories of impact and, and what you're actually accomplishing. You can't do that at the last minute when you're trying to write a grant proposal. You need to be doing it all along and letting your audience know um, what the enterprise is all about. Okay, so it's marketing, distribution, looking for partnerships, collecting the metrics uh, in order to kind of inform any any um, grant grant applications or or other funding opportunities you may have. Right, right. But, or putting it on your website and letting people know. I mean. Sure. You know, I think we're in an age of, per of not only personal branding, but for a lot of these um, independent new startups, it's it's site branding as well. And you can't assume that just because you got a law change that everyone in your community is going to know that you were a, a catalytic force behind that. So we've got to let people know. Blow your own trumpet. Great. Right. <laughs> okay, Jen. Thank you very much indeed. It's been okay. Really thank you. It's good talk. See you. Bye. Bye.